officially you've said before, but I'm just rehashing. You do not work for the Zimbabwean government. You do not work for ZANU PF. However, you do have a relationship with many of the guys there, and it's a decent, good relationship. Hundred Because the work you're doing is to shine a light on Zimbabwe to get investors in to ensure that sanctions are removed. So for that reason, you get along with the Zimbabwean government and you're not hostile towards them as so many other people are. And on record, they have I have been offered a job in 2019 by the okay. government of Zimbabwe. Um, we didn't agree on a number of issues, hence I, I wasn't interested. And many people have thought that I do what I do because I want to be noticed by the government so that I can be offered a job. You've been offered. You've been noticed before. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, in 2019, I was actually flown out to Arare to have a very important meeting with a critical uh, department there. But we couldn't agree on terms. We had another secondary meeting here in Johannesburg, and still we could not agree. And we're still now. I've built a very big profile continentally. I am not interested in working for the government of Zimbabwe because it would muzzle my position, it would muzzle my voice. I would not be able to undertake the current fight I'm undertaking against sanctions. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to go to court against uh, the South African banks. And guess what, Biden, Joe Biden responded to our papers in South African courts and he's now asking Durko to give him immunity. And we are saying, thank God for you to ask Jacob for immunity because we're going to challenge you on the same precedence that was set with Grace Mugabe when Grace Mugabe has offered you uh, immunity by Durko, but Afri Forum went to challenge it in court and the court decided that Grace Mugabe shouldn't have been given immunity. We are now saying Joe Biden cannot be asking for immunity in South African courts where he gets immunity only for him to write executive orders and sanctions, which he then threatens and coerces South African companies to break South African laws to implement his sanctions. He's committing a crime and forcing South Africans to commit crimes. So we don't believe that he should be given immunity. Please, That's please simplify that for people. What do you mean by immunity? <laughs> right. So. When we, when we went against the banks in South Africa, we notified uh, and cited Joe Biden, um, Secretary of State, uh, the Department of, uh, um, As of Foreign Assets uh, Control, which belongs to the Treasury, and also Nancy Pelosi. And this, we this was representing Zimbabwe to say that South African banks are, are not acting in good faith. They are assisting in the sanction business. They are implementing sanctions yeah. and uh, they are blocking people's accounts, blocking payment clearances and blocking uh, 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 banking relations with Zimbabwe okay. on the basis of implementing U.S. sanctions, which have been said to be illegal by the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So we then went to the South African courts and we we're applying for a declaratory order that says that South African banks cannot implement illegal sanctions that the United Nations has said are illegal. And the United Nations wrote a report that is called AHRC 5133, in which they actually say that no third party countries or their companies can implement illegal unilateral sanctions mm -hmm. because it's illegal. So what we are saying to the courts in South Africa is you have to write a declaratory order that says South African banks or any institution or financial institution cannot implement illegal unilateral sanctions. Yeah. And so Biden, because he needs the South African banking system to continue to implement U.S. sanctions and anti-money laundering regulations, he answered to the papers after 13 months to say that, first of all, the South African courts have no bearing on him or this issue. And it is that this issue that makes the issue complicated, where he's saying that South African courts have no bearing on U.S. sanctions that are being implemented in South Africa by South African institutions. He gets that wrong because his executive orders enjoin countries outside America and Americans not to materially assist the government of Zimbabwe, not to make payment clearances for the government of Zimbabwe, and not to give technology, uh, logistics. And once he does that, he's now forcing South African companies, South African banking institutions and financial institutions to implement his illegal sanctions and break South African law, which says no one can be uh, discriminated, no one's rights can be taken away from them, and of course, no one can be punished without trial. And sanctions are punishment without trial. Mm -hmm. And Biden is forcing South African banks and institutions to do that because they cry that if we don't do it, we get penalized. However, yeah. having said that, they are lying because in Zimbabwe, we had a bank that ignored all U.S. sanctions mm -hmm. 15,400 times. They got penalized 
and they decided to take it on review. They went to courts and they got one of the biggest law firms in the world to take the issue on. The American government recognized that they were on the wrong and they canceled all the penalties, $300 million worth of penalties that mm. they had penalized this bank, which had been taken down from $3.5 billion. So that precedent set by the Zimbabwean bank illustrates that banks can challenge the American action and penalties and they can win, illustrating that you can't enforce an, in, an illegality. And that's what we hope that South African banks have to start doing against the Americans as well. And, and Biden wanted immunity to be like, allow me to carry on. And if ever there's an issue, I want to be isolated as I'm allowed to do this compared to other people. He basically is saying, South African courts, you don't have any bearing on me. You don't have any authority to ask me questions or to hold me accountable. And Durkham has officially... Durkham has given that stance. immunity. And we are saying that the South African courts have got every right to question his executive orders, yeah. if those executive orders are what are forcing South African institutions to implement his sanctions, even if they want, didn't want to implement the sanctions. So it's gonna be interesting that for the first time, an American president is being held accountable in an African court by Africans for sanctions that he wants to force yeah. other people to implement. And ultimately it's also going to have bearing on the implementation of uh, what do we call it, um, um, anti-money laundering regulations. Mm -hmm. As you can see, Sekunjalo has been whipping the banks in the, in, in, in the courts. I don't know and about whipping, but they, they at least fighting back. They're fighting back and, and the courts have made rulings that stop mm -hmm. their bank accounts from being closed. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be very important. It goes to speak to, you said, what are other things you are doing? I went to a conference in which I had to make a presentation to the African bar of lawyers mm -hmm. uh, at UNISA. And I was telling the African bar that we cannot have a situation where South African banks can become the spanner in the works of the Africa continental free trade area, where they have so much power, so much dominance that has been acquired from apartheid, a crime against humanity. Then they use this muscle that they get from a crime against humanity to implement U.S. sanctions on the continent and to bar development of black and African peoples by blocking their accounts arbitrarily on the basis that they're implementing uh, uh, anti-money laundering regula regulations mm -hmm. or closing the accounts of perps, politically exposed persons, or closing the accounts of people that are alleged to be money laundering, and usually those will be black Africans, while the white monopoly companies and the Glencores that actually have been caught undertaking crimes or financial crimes don't have their accounts blocked mm. and don't have any form of de-risking taking place. It's a form of racism. South African banks are a threat the Africa, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement because their job is to stop black businesses from developing and to give white businesses in South Africa and from the West an advantage over the Chinese, the Russians, and Africans. And that shouldn't be acceptable. And that's what I said at um, the... Um, Did they respond? They wouldn't respond. What, what was interesting is there's a lady who <laughs> called me um, soon after I did, I did something on TV and, and a lady called me and she said that she is responsible for seeking talent to talk at, um, at uh, banking institutions uh, conferences. Mm -hmm. And she invited me to talk at an APSA conference. And I said, said, what do we have in common with APSA? Why would APSA want me to speak yeah. at their event? Because we don't have anything in common. Yeah. But when, what is happening though is something interesting. Um, the Zimbabwean government was given loans recently mm. by two South African banks, APSA and Standard Bank. Okay. And they offered the Zimbabwean government $192 million to build hospitals and clinics. Okay. APSA and Standard Bank and no South African bank has offered the Zimbabwean government any loans ever since sanctions began in 2001. Mm. And so we believe that this was the banking system trying to mitigate what we're doing by going to the Zimbabwean government, offering them loans. And we believe they also offered them loans for the Bait Bridge pro border project. Mm. But they're doing this after we started the case. And the question is, why now? You haven't been given this government money for 22 years. You say it was unbankable, it was under sanctions. High so what happened to the stability? 100%. What happened to the sanctions now? So we believe that they have made a deal with our government to say, we will give you this but try and make sure that the case in South Africa doesn't go ahead. You see, so whenever we need- That's, that's just a conspiracy theory. We need so to officially state that. It, it's, it's, a, it's a conspiracy theory. I'm, I'm trying but, to protect you. But there are bases for us to say it. I hear you. You know, 
And so that is the interesting thing. Not only that, we've got nine or 11 banking, corresponding banking relationships that have been reinstated between the time we instituted the case and now. Mm. And uh, we're saying, this is interesting. We haven't been having Zimbabwe creating corresponding banking relationships for 22 years. Yeah. In fact, they've been getting canceled. And then all of a sudden, these banks are starting to come back to reinstituting corresponding banking relationships because of the pressure coming from this case. So there is monetary benefits that have already started accruing from the work that we're doing in the courts in South Africa and the activism, this pressure activism that I keep telling my government about to say, you can't muzzle me because mm -hmm. what I do might not be suitable from a, 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 a diplomatic perspective, yes. but in real terms, it puts pressure on even the enemies of Zimbabwe to sometimes do things that will advantage the government. But it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. There are times I'm going to criticize the government and the government is also going to have to either yield, change, or modify the way it works mm -hmm. um, to suit the Zimbabwean people in areas where we as the Zimbabwean people are not happy. You looked at the way they created the Patriotic Act. Mm -hmm. We put pressure on the Patri uh, to create the Patriotic Act. We proposed it, then we lobbied, and then people in Zanopia who felt it was a good idea to punish Zimbabweans who go outside Zimbabwe to the United States, to the U.S. Congress, to ask for sanctions. The Zanopia officials thought that was a good idea. They created the law. Mm -hmm. So that's what pressure activism is about. NGOs non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations work both ways. It's not only the Americans that can put these into our countries and use them against our governments. Mm -hmm. We also can have locally based civil society organizations that work in the national interest to pressure not only our government, but even foreign governments from the things that they've been doing. You've got me thinking about a lot of things. I want to start off by highlighting because people will assume that it's just Zimbabweans that get discriminated by South African banks. And what you're speaking about is not just Zimbabweans. You're speaking about all Africans or Africans that are pro-Africa, pan-African, pro-Black. We've had Tutuzane Zumos had his accounts closed. Iqbal's survey of Segunjalo, they tried, he's fought back. It would be nice to actually get a list of all the people um, who have had their accounts frozen. Julius their Malema. Closed. Julius Malima was another guy that I saw in the media as well. Yeah. And uh, the fact Ciro that Ramaphosa's son. Andile Ramaphosa Andile as well. Ramaphosa. Um, and, you, and you're very correct. People like Marcus Yostad, Steinhoff, the guys at Glencorp, nothing has ever happened. So we need to, people need <laughs> KPMG, to research that. nothing happened. Deloitte. <laughs> Deloitte, well. AOL. 